right, welcome everybody. I would like to thank you all so much for joining us for the very first of our 2021 speaker series in this partnership between the Oshawa Public Libraries and the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at Ontario Tech University. I'd like to begin our evening together with a land acknowledgement. We are thankful to be welcome on these lands in friendship. The lands we are situated on are covered by the Williams Treaties and are the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, a branch of the Greater Anishinaabe Nation, including Algonquin, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. These lands remain home to many Indigenous nations and peoples. We acknowledge this land out of respect for the Indigenous nations who have cared for Turtle Island, also called North America, from before the arrival of settler peoples until this day. Most importantly, we acknowledge that the history of these lands has been tainted by poor treatment and a lack of friendship with the First Nations who call them home. This history is something we are all affected by because we are all treaty people in Canada. We all have a shared history to reflect on and each of us is affected by this history in different ways. Our past defines our present, but if we move forward as friends and allies, then it does not have to define our future. Our general process for this evening will be turning things over to our speaker for approximately 30 minutes of a presentation, which will then leave us with approximately 30 minutes for a Q&A discussion afterwards. Uh, we would appreciate it greatly if until the Q&A, you could please keep your microphone muted so that we can all hear our speaker fully and then we can get to all of your questions afterwards. So without further ado, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Peter Stute, the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at Ontario Tech University, who is here with us this evening to school us in some important lessons about biodiversity and us, the emerging extinction event of the 2020s. Okay. Oh, okay. Mm. okay, am I up? <laughs> Looks good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Andrea. And uh, thank you for that wonderful land acknowledgement as well. Um, we take great pride in uh, at Ontario Tech and especially in my faculty, Social Science and Humanities, uh, with our <clears throat> concerns for social justice and uh, many issues related to Indigenous people fall into that category, of course. And uh, as you'll see in, in my presentation shortly, uh, it's a major factor uh, when it comes to biodiversity conservation as well. So I thought today I'd talk a little bit about what I do with IPIS and I'll explain what IPIS is. Um, basically it's an international organization that works on biodiversity uh, issues and conservation issues. And then I'll talk a bit about what I, what I have referred to here as an extinction event. Um, many scientists are concerned that we have entered uh, an extinction event, and this is coincident with climate change and, and other serious uh, global environmental problems. However, uh, since we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, many people are concerned about um, the causes of the pandemic and dealing with avoiding, I should say, future pandemics. So that's another issue that I'll, I'll mention today, too, because it relates. And in fact, you'll see one of the things that I've done with IPIS is help co-author a report um, on uh, pandemics and how we can avoid future pandemics. And then I'll, I'll finish with a brief discussion of one of the um, IPIS assessments, which they're called, uh, which I am currently uh, chairing. Uh, that has to do with invasive species, which are one of the biggest threats uh, to biodiversity. And you can see this guy down here, um, that's a lionfish which is uh, um, a, uh, a highly invasive species in the Caribbean, which is wiping out local fish. Um, and there are many others, of course, examples that I can give you. So I'm having trouble. Um, yeah, that's, this is when this happens, of course. So, okay. Um, 
Yeah, so I, th I think everyone's well aware, of course, that you know we can't live without nature. I don't think, I'm hoping, no one here needs convincing of that. Uh, it's, it's pretty self-apparent, I think. Um, not only does nature provide uh, sustenance to us, but it also is, uh, I think, an essential feature of uh, mental health. This has been established again and again. And um, of course, there's been a lot of work done on this on these linkages, so it's very important. Um, my wife actually works in this area, biodiversity and, and human health, with the World Health Organization. So um, she can tell you more than I can about it, but uh, I certainly know how how significant it is. Um, and yet, at the same time, nature and and these vital contributions that it makes is deteriorating. And one of the reasons for this, of course, is that. We are in a situation now where, uh, because of years of globalization, we have increased distances between where products are extracted from the earth, uh, where they're produced, and how they end up on our kitchen tables, in our clothing, uh, the cars we drive, even green cars, which use uh, rare minerals, uh, and so on. So this distance, if you wish, between nature and consumption of nature uh, has really changed things. And, and I come at things from a, a social science perspective more than a natural science, although obviously I work in all, all these areas. Uh, and it strikes me increasingly so that um, it's this disjunction between the things we consume and the places they come from um, that has created a lot of the problems uh, that we're in right now. Um, I keep getting notices about people wanting to enter the, or yeah, can you do that? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you National Geographic for this visual. Um, I'm allowed to steal it, I checked it out. Um, so these are mass extinctions in the past, as you can see, there have been um, uh, six that we're aware of, right? Or sorry, five that we're aware of, yeah, five that have been scientists I'll accept. Um, and the concern is that we're entering the sixth one. So the number five there, this of course is when the dinosaurs were wiped out. That's the one everyone's familiar with, I guess. Um, a meteor or an asteroid, right? Which uh, fell in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Um, the other extinction events were in fact, in, in many cases, even more calamitous. But basically we're looking at a situation where between um, over, usually over 70% of species are in fact wiped out by an event. And it doesn't mean it happened in one day. Um, and some of these events took place over um, thousands of years and millions of years. And of course, with the present concern we have uh, is that we're losing biodiversity at such a rate that we might be entering the sixth uh, mass extinction event, which of course would be shameful uh, if that was the case because it is almost completely, if not completely, attributable to human activity. So how do we know all this and, and what sort of information are we sharing with the world? Um, there are various organizations that look at biodiversity issues, and uh, but one of the more interesting ones, I think, and one of the more author authoritative now is the uh, Intergovernmental um, Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. That's what IPIS stands for. Um, IPIS was created in 2012. Um, it's, it's an independent intergovernmental body, but it does report to the United Nations. So for example, when we have a uh, UN assembly, uh, environmental assembly meeting in Nairobi, uh, Kenya, this is where IPIS presents its work. This is where IPIS gets its mandate. Um, and at the same time, IPIS has its own um, programs and it has its own uh, organizational structure. It's located in Bonn, Germany, the Secretariat. Um, it's been an immense pleasure working with them uh, <clears throat> over the last uh, couple of years. And, and it has collaborative arrangements with other uh, United, United Nations agencies, of course, which I mentioned some uh, in this slide. Um, really important to note that it is independent. Um, ultimately, governments do influence it because governments uh, will vote on whether or not to accept the, the final recommendations and, and the final um, product, which are these assessments I'll talk about. But that being said, the scientists that work for IPIS, and uh, no matter what their field, um, are uh, assumed to act independently um, of governmental influence and, of course, of uh, 
corporate influence or others. So IPIS is primarily involved in assessing the knowledge that's out there. So these assessments are global in scope. Um, they look at the literature that has been presented um, by scientists and others. They look at the policies that exist. They look at problems, they look at issues, and they come up with, of course, uh, uh, reports which include sort of an assessment of the state of things, but also um, not direct recommendations because we're not supposed to do that. Um, but we identify policy options, as we call it. So um, in 2016, the first assessment was produced. This was on pollinators. And it did draw attention to the fact that we're certainly facing a crisis in pollination. Um, <clears throat> and, and this threatens, of course, to exacerbate as time passes. Um, so anyone concerned with uh, bees and butterflies and so on, um, look at that report if you want a good assessment. Land degradation, restoration, that came out in 2018. Um, as I'll say shortly, land degradation is the single biggest threat uh, to biodiversity right now. 2021, uh, sustainable use of wild species and invasive alien species, the one that I'm chairing, um, those assessments began um, or should be ready, I think, um, by 2022 in the first case. Um, ours probably won't be ready until 2023. Um, some delays related to pandemics and so on. Um, it also produces issues on scenarios and models, predicting the future, um, and, and how we can look at uh, different mo modeling techniques. And there's also an ongoing assessment now about environmental values, which I think many will find interesting, especially from a humanities perspective. And there's also regional um, assessments. So. Prior to the global assessment, we conducted regional assessments, um, North America, Africa, Asia, um, and, and, and uh, Europe. And so these, these regional assessments were very important because they helped us construct the global assessment itself. Um, the desire here is that these will produce uh, policy support for policymakers, they'll build capacity uh, for <coughs> IPIS members and, and stakeholders including <clears throat> NGOs that are interested in the environment and the work that they're doing. And they'll catalyze a new generation of, uh, of knowledge, of course. And this is very important. A good chunk of IPIS, I think, is devoted to training future scientists as well, because we work with um, fellows that join us and most of them are at the junior level, if you wish. So it helps their CVs, but it also helps us because they do a lot of good work. Um, and of course, every assessment produces a summary for policymakers. And I only stress this because if it's one thing you're going to read about an IPIS assessment, you might want to read the summary for policymakers. It really sums things up, but it's written directly for um, governmental actors so they can read it and try and get their acts together and act accordingly. Now, of course, m many of us are aware of, uh, you know, the fact that governments don't wake up, uh, a government leader probably isn't going to wake up first thing in the morning, read an IPIS report, and, and then um, you know decide that they're going to change the course of history. Um, right. So in fact, we have some leaders um, not too far from here, um, which uh, would, would probably not even begin to read such a report. <laughs> but uh, very thankfully, in my opinion, um, on Wednesday, we'll have a bit of a change taking place there. Um, in fact, Joe Biden has already, I don't know if you know this, but he's, he's already decided to appoint a science um, cabinet minister. Right? So this is, uh, this is a first. Um, so the, the global assessment itself, this came out in May 2019. It's made the most noise so far, I think, and, and in terms of um, clearly uh, presenting the crisis that we're in. Um, the most comprehensive global picture, I think, in, in uh, ever produced probably. Um, and and it, it produced, uh, uh, you know, the overall conclusion that trends are very worrying, they're clearly unsustainable, uh, and it, it, it does include a call for action, right? So prompt action, which is absolutely necessary, tackling the root causes of nature's deterioration, yes, Coordinating uh, across sectors and scales, I'll come back to that, but that's very vital. I think one of the main things that comes out of this and other reports, and I'll stress this again, um, is that there is such an enormous 
um, advantage to investing in preventing more degradation of nature. Um, there's a cost advantage there, an economic advantage. I mentioned previously already, you know, physical, mental health uh, advantages and so forth, right? So the costs of prevention um, are, are minuscule compared to the costs of reaction, basically, which is where we're at with the pandemic too, of course. With the, with the global report, this gives you a sense of the, the author team. Um, this was a little bigger than the one I'm chairing right now. Um, they had 145 experts from 51 countries. And these are really top scientists around the world that have dedicated their time to do it. Um, they make they like to stress this, yeah, that they had 156,000 um, hours of voluntary work. So if you put all that together, it's like 17 years. Um, and in addition to the 145 experts, we also had 310 contributing authors. So these are people that are asked to come in and write um, part of a chapter, if you wish. Um, you'll see at the top that most of it is natural scientists, it's true, 58%, but that a good solid third were social scientists. And this is pretty unique. Usually in assessments like this, it's one or the other. We've got social scientists working in their little field and we've got natural scientists over here. And then we've got that 9% nine, 9 interdisciplinary. I'm not sure how they determine that. I'd love to put myself in that category if I had to, but um, gender, there, there's an effort at gender balance not achieved here, as you can see. Uh, we've done better in, in our assessment actually on invasive species than that. The biggest thing, the innovation of IPIS uh, more than anything else I think is that you've got a clear effort and a very strong effort to ensure that you do have scientists and authors from the Southern hemisphere participating uh, in these assessments. Right? And I can tell you from personal experience that is rigorously um, reinforced at every turn, okay? So we have a set number of authors that we're going to take from certain geographic areas so that we have some balance and we don't just have a report that's written by um, a bunch of uh, North American white males, for example. Yeah, so, you know, we, we try our best to have some sort of diversity inherent in the report. Um, but there's no question, drivers of change have accelerated during the past uh, 50 years, um, unprecedented levels in, in human history. Um, and if you look at the direct drivers that are influencing this mass extinction that we're seeing today, um, as I said before, terrestrial, that's on land, freshwater and marine, in all three of these areas, um, land and sea use change is, is more most important, but direct exploitation remains important taking um, species right out of, uh, especially when it comes to the fisheries. You'll notice that the, at the, on the marine level, um, direct exploitation is in fact even bigger than sea use change, which makes sense. We have a fisheries crisis globally. Um, we are draining the oceans. There are some notable examples of sustainable fisheries, but for the most part, it's out of control. Um, climate change is a major contributor as well and pollution, whether it's plastic or chemical pollution, what have you. Um, this is also a major threat, especially the freshwater species that live um, in amphibians, for example, that live in freshwater. Invasive alien species I've already talked about, but they're certainly there in the, in the top. So these are what we call the top five, the dirty five, if you wish. Um, invasive species come in, they take over an area and they wipe out native species. Right. They, um, they either eat them directly or in, in most cases, what happens is that they, they limit their ability to reproduce. Right. So they take over, um, they'll, they'll take over the food sources, what have you. Um, and they're introduced by humankind to certain areas for different reasons. So all these, these are the main, the main areas. There are others, of course, uh, other causes, but these are the main threats that we face. Now, those are direct drivers. Just as importantly, and I think from a social science perspective, more importantly, we have what we call indirect drivers, right? So these are factors which are changing on a global level, uh, which impact the direct drivers themselves and exacerbate what's happening. Right? So demographic and social cultural factors um, this is referring to population growth and so on. It's also referring to um, uh, consumption, 
and the sort of mass consumption that characterizes uh, you know, the global economy um, today. I know the pandemic, it's slowed down a bit, but don't worry, we'll get back at it as soon as we're, we can do it and advertise and so on. Um, economic and technological changes, uh, institutions and governance, very important because arguably one of the reasons that we're in this mess is that we haven't had adequate governance. Uh, we've had a failure or a crisis even of governance here. And for that, I always use the word um, justice when I talk about uh, sustainability. Um, and I know that uh, <clears throat> um, one of my professors is here, Tim, uh, you'll agree with me that this, these are justice issues. Um, and of course, conflicts, you know, epidemics are often related to conflicts, by the way. Um, and uh, conflicts have a significant impact on the environment. So it's often a neglected factor, but it's, it's very uh, uh, deleterious to the environment. So the report found basically looking at all the literature that's out there, right? I mean, literally um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of papers that have been written by scientists over the last you know, 20, 30 years. We've got a global extinction rate now. It's probably at um, 10 to 100 times higher than it's been on average over the last 10 million years. And so this is why scientists are concerned that we're entering an extinction rate, basically. There's a background extinction rate, many of you will know this, um, that we naturally expect to occur. Um, we are exceeding that uh, at an exceptional rate. Background rate is about you know, one to two extinctions per million species per year. So it's, it's very limited in that sense. Um, we are in fact moving um, way up above that when it comes to amphibians right now. Um, we're above that probably when it comes to mammals, birds, reptiles, fishes, all of these things, because the average extinction, background extinction rate, again, is between, sorry, I got that wrong the first time, between 0 0.1, right, um, to 0 0.2 extinctions per million species. We're looking at around two and a half now for amphibians. Um, th these are startling figures, and uh, they've certainly got people very scared and thinking about what impact this will have. The report itself made a lot of splash when it um, uh, came out with the conclusions that around 1 million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, many within decades. Um, and this is more than ever before in, in human history. The average abundance of native species uh, in most major land-based habitats has fallen by at least 20%, um, mostly since 1900. So think about that, you know, 20% of the species that, that we have recorded since that time have um, uh, been significantly reduced in abundance. It doesn't mean they're all extinct, by the way, but it means that they've significantly reduced uh, in abundance. And we, we get a lot of some pushback on this. Well, how do you know it's a million species? Um, well, we don't, okay? It's an estimate. Um, it's an educated estimate. It's based on the work of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, which you can check out, IUCN. Um, they produce a red list, which is sort of the, the most authoritative assessment of um, the state of uh, certain species. And uh, um, based on that, and based on the formula that's right here, um, the calculation was that we're looking at about a, a million uh, species, which are threatened uh, with extinction. Right? So I won't go into detail about that, but you can you can see it there. And all this is on uh, IPIS website. You can find all this information if you're interested. So we've deeply reconfigured the uh, the biosphere and the atmosphere. And this many of you have heard the term Anthropocene. So you know we've we've entered a new era, geologic era, where the human influence is the most um, pervasive uh, on the planet. And we're changing things indelibly. You know, anyone who's looked at the impacts of climate change uh, knows this already with rising sea levels and so on. Um, plastic pollution, I, I do a lot of work in plastic pollution. And we have found plastic pollution in, uh, not just in human bodies, um, we found it in uh, the top of the Himalayas. It's been found in the deepest part of the oceans. It's been found in rain. <laughs> it's actually coming down from the clouds in rain because it's been picked up um, by the um, 
a geological uh, cycle. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really um, uh, quite fascinating what we've done to the earth and how we've changed it. 75% of the land area is significantly altered. 66% of ocean area is exper experiencing increasing cumulative impacts and 85% of wetland area has been lost. And these are figures basically since 1900. Um, the last one is particularly damaging because wetlands are very important ecosystems. And I know there's a debate going on right now in Ontario, in fact, very close to uh, Ontario Tech University about whether or not um, current efforts to build um, warehouses and factories in some wetlands um, on near Lake Ontario are a good idea. I don't think they are. I think we need to preserve as much wetland as we possibly can. And I know there are some people very concerned about that at the university and elsewhere in the region. Um, wetlands protect us basically um, from storms. Um, they also help filter water. I could go on and on. But one of the main things that wetlands provide is biodiversity as well. Many species find their home there. So this again is another way of looking at the extinction uh, risk. This is used in the assessment uh, at some length. These are just different types of um, uh, families within the animal kingdom and, this, and, and different species, of course. Um, and you can get a sense from this, I think, of, you know, um, it's the red that we're most worried about. The, the red um, are critically endangered, right? And you're seeing increases in, in mammals and amphibians in particular, birds. Um, the ones that are of least concern doesn't mean they're not of concern, right? Um, they're still cert certainly of concern. And it doesn't take much. Sometimes there's a tipping point where, you know, you go from red or sorry, from green to red um, very quickly, especially if your habitat gets destroyed and these are species that live in habitats. Um, we've also severely reduced the number of uh, domesticated um, plants and animals that we have, right? So especially when it comes to birds, but also when it comes to corn and other species like this. And this has been driven by economic processes. This is not a natural thing. It's just that we've, we've learned over the time, we'll make more money by focusing on specific species that are easier to raise and that cost less money perhaps in the production cycle and that make a bigger profit. Um, but what we're doing in the process um, is we're reducing the biological diversity on earth uh, as well. Um, and we have seed banks and so on to try and preserve some of that biodiversity. Um, I mentioned a few recent extinctions here. I think the first species that scientists are now saying definitely is related to climate change is a, a rodent that actually managed to, to survive in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, it's gone extinct and, and the argument there is that it was specifically due to climate change because climate change affects um, coral reefs as we might know. And uh, this, this uh, melamite could, could no longer survive. There, there's some other species I list here. Um, and in many cases, we're, we're noticing the IUCN in particular wants to wait a few years before it declares things extinct. So it's not always that this species went extinct this year. Sometimes they'll wait 20 years. If no one's reported seeing it in 20 years, they'll declare it extinct. I forget the exact years that they wait. But, but I say all this, keep in mind, the bigger concern much bigger concern is the fear that entire ecosystems will start collapsing. Um, and then we're into real, real serious stuff here where we're going to have difficulty surviving. And we know that biodiversity is one of the things that makes an ecosystem thrive. And the bigger issue still, I would argue, is that social drivers are the most important and difficult issues in the Anthropocene. Right? Until we actually manage those issues, until we change human behavior, um, reduce conflict, and, and lower our consumption patterns, for example, um, we are going to face these problems. So these beautiful creatures like Indian cheetah and, and the Sphinx macaw um, and, and, and uh, tigers and so on, we all care about those a great deal, obviously, right? Um, no one wants to see the extinctions take place at that level. But <clears throat> the bigger concern isn't the individual species, it is in fact, the uh, ecosystems in which they live and in which we live. Because even if you live in the middle of a massive city, you're still living in an ecosystem. It's just an urban ecosystem. Um, I won't go over this in detail. I know time is short. So 
um, these, these are just some indicators that we use. Right? And you can see that typically there are rises, right? And we're, we're moving up when it comes to most of these um, issues that are driving biodiversity loss, including fertilizer use at the bottom. You'll notice that. And then it's happening not just in the so-called developed, but also in the developing or least developed uh, worlds as well. Um, we've had a fourfold uh, around the fourfold increase in the global economy, a tenfold increase in global trade. And again, as I mentioned in the introduction, the spatial segregation of production and consumption. And this is since 1970. I want to stress the, the role of Indigenous people in local communities. It's a big part of any IPIS assessment. Um, and this is, IPIS really deserves, I think, accolades for this because it brings in Indigenous voices um, specifically, purposefully, uh, and with great respect. Um, and Indigenous people, of course, are uh, uh, oppressed in many parts of the world. We know that. Um, there are also, many would argue, you know, the most important guardians of biodiversity. And th this is just a, a imagery that we use in the report indicating different ways in which they actually <clears throat> do this to many of the different work that uh, they provide in, in their day-to-day -day survival. Um, the wisdom that's locked in to indigenous worldviews, it's something that we have to tap into and combine, of course, with Western science. And um, we're, we've made progress in the invasive species um, assessment. We've, we've had uh, indigenous workshops where we've spoken to people from around the world um, to get a sense of how they're responding to what could be very damaging invasions of other species. Um, so they're involved in creating cultural landscapes, um, not just physical landscapes, but cultural landscapes, right? That, you know, images of the land that are then mix. And um, I mentioned this earlier, I don't know if anyone heard this, but um, I'm hoping that she can join us next week. Um, Dorothy Taylor um, is uh, one of our local indigenous uh, elders in the uh, Durham region. And I'm hoping that she'll join us February 1st, I think, for the next um, episode of Beyond the Walls. And she's going to talk about water and, and its fundamental importance to our life and indigenous worldviews. So I'm going to plug that right away. Um, but 25% of global land is on what's considered indigenous land. And um, there are other factors here that, that I've mentioned uh, in this graphic that are very important. Um, we need to tap into that knowledge, as I've said before, but we also have to be aware that they're under increasing pressure. And in fact, most local indicators do show decline in areas where indigenous people are living. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this I won't go over in, in great detail. It's yet another um, rather depressing uh, graphic. So <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> now, that being said, you know, there are scenarios uh, that we can envision which will help get us out of this mess. And that's very important. We do have 2030 sustainability objectives that will be soon approved by the world community. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there's a 2050 vision for biodiversity as well. And many of you are no doubt aware of the sustainable development goals of the UN. Um, but we need to see some things. We need to see changes in production and consumption of energy and food. We need to see will to moderate population growth. Population, high populations in the Southern hemisphere are not the problem. I think we've established that it's high consumption rates in the north that cause more problems. But that being said, <clears throat> we need to make sure that population growth everywhere um, is fairly low or moderate. Um, and we need, of course, climate change adaptation. Climate change is here, it's not going anywhere. Um, <clears throat> it will continue. So how we adapt to it is going to what's going to matter. And how we adapt to things like the pandemic too, and what sort of recovery plans. Um, so this is a little graphic that was put together just uh, and it's a little too detailed to get into now. But um, clearly we need multi-actor governance interventions and there are certain leverage points as we call them that we can use to try to change things so that we're getting off onto a better foot, okay? So we need to think about decision-making, uh, environmental law, all these things that, that my work's been based on basic, uh, when it comes to environmental issues, um, all these are important, but so are other issues as well. Um, and the leverage points, as I said, they you know that reduce inequalities, practice justice and inclusion and conservation. The environment's one of those issue areas you can really look at 
I think, as um, something that draws together social justice concerns with um, medical um, and uh, scientific issues. So it's, it's a, a great area to work in if you're interested in justice, broadly defined. Um, food production and conservation goals have to be complementary and in, interdependent. People are not going to stop eating. Um, and there are many societies where, frankly, consuming meat uh, is, is essential to health, such as the Inuit. And, and so, so, you know, we're, we're very, I, I personally, anyways, get very concerned when um, people put forth as the answer is that we stop eating meat entirely. Um, that's, but there's no doubt about it. You know, we need to eat less of it. It's highly wasteful and so on. But the big challenge that it presents to biodiversity is that it's based on land degradation. It's based on land use change. It's based on tearing down forests to build uh, more farms. Forest uh, fisheries, I've already mentioned. Um, it's, I, I don't have time to go into that, but it's probably, I think one of the most severe crises we face uh, at, at the present time. Um, and I've already mentioned climate change mitigation. That has to happen anyway. So let's look at ways we can do that that will help conserve uh, biodiversity in the process. And then there's this thing called nature-based solutions, which many people are advocating right now as, as a really good uh, solution base, especially in cities. Um, so how can we use nature? How can we plant more trees, urban agriculture, um, things like this? These will not only help us deal with climate change, but they'll also help us deal ultimately with um, biodiversity crisis. And then I mentioned already indigenous people, right? So recognizing their innovations, recognizing their role, giving them political power. Now that's not, that's much easier said than done. So, but I'm not, uh, I'm not preaching anything naive here. You know, we need to take into account the reality, sometimes brutal reality of political power and oppression. That is part of the equation here. Um, since the report came out, it, it's, it received unprecedented global interest. Before the pandemic hit, everybody was talking about biodiversity for a while, right? Um, probably because the report was so scary, but also because we had world leaders like um, Emmanuel Macron and, and others, um, some of which you see here, taking on the issue. <clears throat> and you know that, that's, that was a fantastic um, little moment for IPIS, if you wish. But it, it, and we, uh, this is, we like to show this because it was the day after the report came out, pretty well every major newspaper had it on the front page. Um, pandemics. Um, so one of the things that we did um, lately was we had a special pandemic workshop and I was present there and I was, I'm one of the authors on the report that has come out. This is the citation that we use. Um, I, many people don't realize this, but 70% of emerging diseases um, and almost all known pandemics have been caused by microbes of animal origin. Right? Um, and the microbes spill over due to contact among wildlife, livestock, and people, right? So they're not coming from nowhere, right? Uh, COVID-19, we think probably came from some bat species. Um, it may have infected another species, including some species in the, in the wildlife trade, which then got into human bodies, right? So that right now, there's a crew that's been, that's gone over to China to try and figure all this out. Of course, there are rumors that uh, I know it was made in a Chinese lab and purposely spread and so on. There's no evidence for that right now. Um, but there is, there is, of course, we want to investigate it. Um, the majority of emerging diseases, right? Um, and almost all known pandemics though, are caused from animal origin. This is called zoonosis. So Ebola, Zika, Nipah, encephalitis, um, all these things as far as we know it, and including influenza like the Spanish flu, HIV AIDS, COVID-19, all zoonosis. So we have to look at the animal kingdom, not as a threat, mind you, right? But a way to preserve it because the more biodiversity there is in the natural kingdom, the less likely it is that we will in fact be infected by these. And there's different theories that demonstrate this. But one of the main concerns, of course, is just simple contact, right? Um, wild areas that exist right now, for the most part, um, we should stop incursion, incursion into them, um, stop tearing them down to build farms. That would be a good start. And then we're going to be less exposed to these viruses. People often ask, will we have another, another pandemic like this? Absolutely, we will. I, I, I don't see any way we won't. Um, 
We estimated in this report, given the prevalent literature right now, there's something like 1.7 million currently undiscovered viruses in mammal and avian hosts. Now that's an estimate, of course, right? But, and, and of these, you know, something like six to 800,000 have the ability to infect humans. Um, so, you know, if, if we keep getting exposed to these uh, microbes, there's a good chance we'll have another pandemic like this, maybe even in the near future. The most important reservoirs of pathogens with pandemic potential are mammals, bats, rodents, primates, and some birds. We saw that with West Nile virus and, and so forth, and livestock as well. Right? So this is why people um, advocate what's called a one health approach, where you're looking at wildlife, you're also looking at domesticated animals, and then you're looking at humans and the interaction between these three groups. Okay? So the emergence of pandemics is, is basically driven by human activities. Um, land use change, agricultural expansion, urbanization cause more than 30% of emerging disease events. Again, this conclusion is based on a reading of the prevailing literature, peer reviewed literature that's out there. It's the best science we have right now. Um, and that there are some drivers which, which are influencing this. And I've already mentioned land use change, agricultural expansion, wildlife trade and consumption, both legal and illegal and invasive alien species themselves, which often carry um, pathogens with them. And now climate change is another, again, climate change is this overarching umbrella that casts a shadow on everything that's happening. Um, and it's been implicated in these are disease emergence, such as a tick-borne um, encephalitis in Scandinavia, um, and will increase by every estimation says the same thing that climate change will increase the risk of pandemics in the future. So we need to reduce basically anthropogenic global environmental change. We need to deal with the biodiversity crisis to reduce pandemic risk. This is the ultimate uh, conclusion. Shouldn't surprise you, a report coming out of IPIS would conclude this. But I mentioned before cost versus response. So we estimated the cost of, and this was July, okay? Um, we estimated the cost at that point of the pandemic globally between eight to 16 trillion. If you look at the economic shutdown and the recovery and response costs and everything else, that's a wide range, I realize that, but we don't have precise figures. But by July, 2021, there's a good chance that we're looking at around $30 trillion in costs of this pandemic alone. Whereas One Health surveillance that I just mentioned previously, which would be a very pretty effective way if we could do it on a global level to look at microbes and pathogens that are, um, that are being introduced through things like land use change, that would probably cost around 30 billion globally to do it effectively. Um, and, it, and this is just an order of magnitude um, uh, change, right? So it's a tremendous difference in terms of the costs between the two. We're also looking at um, global strategies that we can induce to, and wildlife trade and farming is a major thing. And so something like 24% of wild terrestrial vertebrate species are traded globally. Wildlife trade is, uh, the legal wildlife trade is around 107 billion, but the illegal wildlife trade is estimated to be worth between seven and 23. This is another area I do, I do a lot of work on. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty deeply immersed in this work right now. Wildlife farming has expanded. So I know that sounds like a contradiction, but there are many areas where things like pangolins, some of these more desirable, highly endangered species are being farmed now, even rhinoceros. Um, <clears throat> they're being farmed and that has increased substantially, um, which might not be a bad thing. You might feel differently about that. But the important thing is to make sure that the health measures are, uh, of course, in place. Um, so farming, trade and consumption of wildlife, um, this has led to biodiversity loss and emerging diseases, including SARS, which some of you will remember, um, probably the last major pandemic that we had, or epidemic anyways, that we had in, in Canada. Um, yeah, so disaggregated and fragmented regulation, my last point here, this is really key because we are not regulating the international wildlife trade the way we should be. We have an international organization called CITES, which is there to try and make sure that endangered species aren't traded, um, but we're not regulating trade in wildlife across the board 
um, for health reasons and so on, the way we should be perhaps. Um, we shouldn't forget the, again, the indigenous component here, many important therapeutics and so on that, that might be able to help us fight um, pandemics and other diseases um, have been lost um, as native, uh, or sorry, as indigenous people um, in many cases uh, have been lost as well, or perhaps we're not hearing uh, their voices. So we come up with some recommendations in terms of, um, we, we, one conclusion is that we need a high level intergovernmental council on pandemic prevention that can provide scientific information. We have organizations that are doing wonderful things like the World Health Organization and so on. But maybe we need another council that can bring some of these groups together, um, coordinate the design of a monitoring framework and lay the groundwork for an agreement, perhaps a new international agreement um, that can, and, and of course, the people that are involved in this report, most of them are strong advocates of the One Health approach that I mentioned earlier. So um, we have to reduce the role of land use change. And so you need incentives to do that, right? To discourage people from expanding farmland and so on, um, reforming financial aid for land use. And I encourage you to look at the report because we do expand on each of these recommendations. I realize some of them seem rather um, idealistic and we can't do them overnight. It's gonna take a great deal of time. But if we're serious about avoiding another massive pandemic like this one, I think um, we should perhaps take this very seriously. And then the wildlife trade, um, there are some more specific or, uh, recommendations here in terms of an intergovernmental health and trade partnership um, that wouldn't just be looking at endangered species, but we'll be looking at trade of all species and the impacts, or sorry, the, the uh, implications that has for the transmission of pathogens and so on. Educating communities, of course, I'm an educator, I always have to have that line, but that's very important. Um, and reducing some species entirely from the wildlife trade, right? Maybe they're not endangered, but we know that they're a high risk of disease emergence. Um, we're not sure how that will play out or what species that would involve, but. So, uh, and finally, I mentioned getting very serious about environmental crime too, because I think that that's very important. Um, Sorry, yeah, um, environmental crime is often taken very lightly. It's, it's not viewed as, as a major uh, criminal issue and yet it certainly is. And then in the, as a good academic, I'll plug my own book here. This, this just came out um, a month ago, literally. So this is a book about um, environmental crime basically that I co-authored with uh, Dion Omro. And we talk about different possible solutions there. Um, money matters, don't forget that. So all this has to be paid for, how? And here are some ideas about how things could be paid for. Um, but one of the big things that's coming out now, of course, is a lot of these COVID-19 recovery plans, the European one in particular, they are putting some money towards um, issues like biodiversity and, and climate change. If we're going to go on a spending spree, um, uh, I know people need relief, small businesses need relief. You don't have to tell me that in the Oshawa region, but, we have to think about these big picture issues too and governments have to think about how they can put some resources towards these because these things will not happen on their own and companies need to have the proper incentive structures and frankly punishment structures uh, if they're engaging in environmental crime. Um, the, the invasive species assessment I've already discussed and I know I'm very short so I'm going to leave it there. This was the group. I'm sorry we don't have more time for uh, comments but I'm, I'm, if there is any I'll leave this up. Um, some conclusions, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Sorry for going on so long. She's mad at me. <laughs> no, I just, I am excited to take the time that we've got in order to turn things over for questions, discussion. Um, I would love to hear from all of our attendees of of questions you have for Peter about these issues. Um, Eric, yeah, go for it. Uh, can you hear me? You yes. sure can. Yep. Um, so one thing that I've been thinking about, uh, you know, basically ever since the last semester of uh, taking policy development is how do we actually talk to people that disagree with this? Like the climate deniers, the science deniers, like those are the actual audience that matters in a way because I'm going to go on a limb and think that everyone in this audience right now wasn't really, you know, 
thinking in their mind, oh, none of this is true. So how do we actually reach across that divide and uh, convince people to, uh, that this is important? Yeah, so there's two answers to that, I think, um, Eric. I mean, one is that um, we need scientific legitimacy. We need reports. We need IPIS to produce this irrefutable evidence. Because if that's not there, you don't have that to stand back on, okay? So we need that. We need the IPCC with climate change and so on. So it's, it's not to... Um, I get your point. There are some people, it doesn't matter. You're not going to convince them of anything. Okay. At the same time, you know, but at the same time, you've, you've got to have what I think this sort of impressive level of scientific evidence um, in order to fall back on it, because that is the basis of your argument. You need to influence the policymakers. Yes, there's an argument. You need to influence people to vote for the right policymakers. I get that. But and I, I've been around the world, of course, and I've been dealing with this issue for years. I can tell you it's pretty limited in terms of the necessity to convince people that these are problems with some notable exceptions. And we saw those notable exceptions in the United States. Yes. OK. But for the most part, especially the climate issue, you go to Europe, you go to Africa, you go to Asia. Um, there is no doubt climate change is happening in anyone's minds. I mean, it's just, you know. So sometimes we get caught up in this, yes, it's all about what's happening in Washington. It's not. Now, the U.S. is still a major right, uh, player. But with the, the election, uh, as I said, very welcome, change is taking place there. Um, I think it'll be less and less an issue, for the, at least for a while. You know, how do we convince the naysayers or, or, or those, the, 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 those that live in denial? I'll put it that way. But there's no magic formula for changing people's minds, uh, as you know. But I, I would argue the brunt of my presentation, really, I'm trying to say is that, and yes, Teresa, IPIS does, IPIS doesn't lobby governments directly, but activists can use IPIS to lobby governments. So we, you should view IPIS and the reports that come out from the UN generally, you know, as evidence that can be used to, to fight the good fight. Sorry, can I unmute and ask? Is that okay? Um, Peter, I was wondering, what do you think in terms of each individual person? You know, people are willing to get on board with things like not getting a straw with their drinks, or but I think people are less keen to make bigger changes like reliance on animal agriculture. Um, so I'm just wondering about how you see the, the relative contribution that each individual can make to these, you know, huge changes that, that need to be made. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, every purchase you make, there, um, ideally, you know, there, there's a little clicker going on in the back of your mind about what are the implications of this, right? Um, if I'm buying something, you know, where does it come from? Who made it? Um, how did it get here? Um, are we making? But I think just as importantly, individuals can try and can try and put pressure on governments to think. Ultimately, you know, we're still reliant on governments for our major decisions. The, um, the incentive structures I mentioned before that could change corporate behavior, that's got to come from governments. It's not, and it could come from judicial decisions as well. But for the most part, it's, it's governments that do that. So just to be as active as possible in lobbying government to think seriously about the consequences of the decisions that are made. And to get this idea across, you know, that the costs of inaction are tremendous. This is so important. You know, whether it's dealing with invasive species, um, if, we'll, if we can prevent an, uh, an invasion with at a relatively low cost, but once that is, other species has come in and invaded an area, um, reducing that is almost impossible, right? It's gonna cost billions of dollars. So we have to think about this in terms of how can we convince policymakers to realize that they need to take preventive action. Individually though, yeah, it's about, it's about consumption, it's about awareness. Um, no one's perfect, no one's an angel, you know. Um, so um, don't, I'm not saying people should beat themselves up over things, but, and, and then I guess, I, I think an idea too that's very important is this notion of social inclusion, you know, and working with indigenous groups and others is, is very important. I have a question. 
Um, so, Peter, there's been some news lately about the um, the pandemic and the you know the the loss of travel um, internationally having some benefits. Um, you know, on, on the uh, environment. And one example they used is the dolphins returning back to Venice, Italy, um, because the water traffic, you know, has declined substantially um, because there's no tourism, obviously, you know, it's really uh, gone. So what are your thoughts in terms of, you know, sort of the, the COVID pandemic and the, I guess the benefits, if there's any benefits to the pandemic, um, about uh, you know its effects on on the environment and biodiversity. Yeah, um, so I, I was in Venice um, not too long ago. Um, in fact, I was there in September, and I can assure you, there's a lot of tourism. There's a lot of boats in the water. Um, uh, there might have been some freak incident where some dolphins came in, but it is not reverted to some you know natural um, Aquarius or something. That, that's, that's just not the case. I wish it was in many ways, but but then I myself was in Venice, so who can I, you know, like I said, there are no angels. Um, yeah, I, th I think that um, we have seen a, a lot of um, species that because of really, I think most importantly, the absence of transportation. So we have seen more and more species that have come back. Um, and that's been interesting. Um, there's no evidence as yet that, you know, any endangered species have made comebacks because of reduced economic activity. And in fact, when it comes to fisheries, we're not seeing reduced economic. The fisheries are still, you know, full steam ahead globally, um, and they're taking byproducts and killing bycatch and, and so on. Speaking of dolphins, right? You got me on the oceans when you mentioned dolphins. Um, one thing we did notice with, with the pandemic definitely was improvements in air quality. And so, so we had reduced use of in, in countries like India and Brazil, um, reduced use of vehicles in particular. Um, and that has made a major uh, change there. Um, unfortunately, one of the things that COVID-19 affects the most are the lungs. And so people that live in areas of, with, with very um, bad air quality have been amongst the most severely affected, right? Just like heavy smokers or others, you know, if, if you live in a place like that, it's gonna be very difficult for, to recover. So, you know, it sort of evens out there. But, but, but we did notice some changes there. Um, but you know, there's. I, I think I'd be very cautious about. Yeah, the pandemic's been good for the environment. Um, there's been some ways in which perhaps it is in the long term. Um, as I said, you know, unless we keep having pandemics, it's not an answer. So what, what we all want to do is get get out of this pandemic. The main point that we make in the pandemic report, the main fear we have, um, is that things will just go back to business as usual, right? So if we could keep some of the measures that we have in place now in terms of um, reduced transportation, uh, environmental costs and so on, I think that would be very uh, a good place to start. That's fantastic, Peter. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for joining us and for your fantastic questions and talking points. Uh, please keep an eye on the Social Science and Humanities social media feeds and the Oshawa Public Library social media feeds for information about the rest of the talks that we have coming up this semester. So it was wonderful to see you all this evening and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Bye everyone, thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Peter. Peter. Thanks everybody. Sorry I went on a little longer than I should have. Thank you though. <laughs> No, it was wonderful. Very interesting. Thanks so much, Peter. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Stay safe.